The following sermon is presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado. We hope you'll be strengthened and encouraged by God's Word today as you listen. Good morning and welcome to Southside Bible Church. Beautiful baptisms this morning to see the glorious grace of God. So grateful for what He's done uh, in our midst. Well, this morning we are going to finish up our study in 2 Peter. So if you'll turn to 2 Peter chapter 3, it's just been a a good season, the Word of God. I've, I've been watching a manifested fruit of what He's doing uh, in our lives as we've opened up this book and sought His face and have been studying really Peter, First and Second Peter, for two to three years now. And I just feel like we've gotten a picture of this man's heart and what made him tick and, and, and really what he discovered in Christ was enough to watch his own wife be crucified before him and then himself be crucified upside down. And so these truths that we have been learning are sufficient to bring you all the way to glory. And so thank you, God, for the beauties of what we've seen in Peter. So let's go and ask him to bless our conclusion of our, our season together in First and Second Peter. Father, I do thank you uh, for the faithful life of Peter I thank you for the way your Holy Spirit has inspired these words for the church of God for thousands of years. I thank you for the sweet privilege that we were able to look at them and study them and that your spirit illuminated them to our minds and hearts and you are changing lives right in our midst. God, we thank you for it. We pray that all the glory would go to you as a saving God. Lord, what a powerful God you are and what we heard this morning has uh, brought my heart just humbled and rejoicing before you. So we thank you, Lord. I pray, meet us as we close out this glorious season that we've had in 2 Peter. Make the application, God, in every heart that you would desire from 2 Peter. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. On chapter 1, Peter called for a steadfastness in our pursuit of Christ and our conformity to Him. Really, the the commands that are given to us in the New Testament are a call to live out in reality what you already are in position, what you are in Christ, to go live it out. Go live it out now in your day-to-day lives. And so Peter called us to, to make our calling and election sure that we have been saved. And he tells us to believe this glorious gospel and then to apply all diligence and to supply to our faith moral excellence. And he he gave us that list in chapter 1 of how we're to grow and hunger and thirst for conformity to Christ because of this gospel. Not to get saved, but because you are saved by the free grace of Almighty God. And so then Peter went into this long warning about false teachers that we studied in chapter 2. If you look just really at chapter 3, verse 15, Peter said, Regard the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given him, wrote to you, as also in all his letters, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to understand, which the untaught and the unstable, these false teachers, distort. They, they turn them and twist them as do the rest of, of all the scriptures to their own destruction. So he said there's these false teachers who will come and they'll twist the scriptures and they're going to point you in different ways. That Greek word for distort, it was used of a stretching machine to torture in that day and age and it would pull and twist you. And they said it, it, it was a profound torture and that is what these false teachers are doing to the scriptures. They're, they're taking them and they're stretching them and they're distorting them to their own ends, for their own lusts and their own desires. We saw that they tried to take away your hope of the day of the Lord and the reward for the faithful and the new heavens and the new earth where righteousness dwells that we looked at last week. And so the way they do this is, is by lusts. They, they, they want to indulge them and they want to enjoy them. And so they turn scriptures into what's called licentiousness, which means you can live any way you want because you're under the grace of God. And so now they come up with a theology that matches their lusts so they can so, so far have God and their lusts. And what God has separated, let no man join together. And the problem with living that way, as Peter says, there's going to be a day of reckoning and a day of judgment. And so we, we have to take that away if we're going to live in our lusts and ignore God. We're going to come up with stuff that will remove it. Like our day and age where we're told that hell is just uh, being out of the mercy of God is all that it is. 
We're told there's annihilationism. You just go into nothing. Or a universalism that says everyone's going to be saved at the end. And we just keep twisting and distorting this coming at the end where God will judge the unrighteous and reward the righteous. He says it from Genesis to Revelation, telling you this day of the Lord will come. And they come and say, in light of that, enjoy your sexual sin. It's okay like millions today in our own country. You can live any way you want. It doesn't matter. And you'll create a theology in your mind that lets you live this way. Well, this morning, Peter's going to tell us that they will try to get you to fall from your own steadfastness, child of God. The way you know if you have come under false teaching from either pastors or your friends or even your own heart is, has it taken you away from your diligence, from your steadfastness of hope in this God and hastening the coming of the Lord? Has it drifted you and think you can live any way you want and it doesn't matter? Do you sit here this morning in that state? And Peter's saying that's a false teacher maybe in your own heart that's allowing you to believe these things and sit in such lies. Because of this gospel, this beautiful gospel that we just saw this morning, it demands my life, my soul, my all, and anything else is a false teaching. The only response is to offer up my body a living sacrifice, to live worthy of the calling that I have received from God. Anything else is a lie if you're sitting here with that this morning. You can't look at this gospel and give a five-cent finish. It takes lies to remove this steadfastness from your heart when you look at Jesus Christ. I, it's going to take lies to get you to say, I'm going to go live different than abandoning my life for the king of kings. <clears throat> so as we close out, I, I have uh, been in introspection. Uh, anytime I finish up a book and just kind of meditating on this season that we've had together and and something that kind of hit me in these closing verses uh, on verse 17 is, of course, therefore, uh, I'm going to spare you. I'm going to spare you why that word means so much to me and not give you a whole sermon again on therefore. But what he says is at the end of verse 17 is these unprincipled men are going to try to get you to fall from your own steadfastness to get you to fall from it. And all I could think of in meditating is you know, it was a few decades before Peter wrote this letter. Uh, he's in an upper room discourse with the Son of God. And Jesus tells his disciples, my time is at hand. I'm going to be killed. I'm going to be crucified. It's time. And he told Peter, Peter, you're going to deny me three times. Three times before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And what is Peter's response? Never. No way, Lord, that, that is not in my heart. It cannot happen. Jesus says, Peter, you, you still don't get it. You don't realize how deceitful your heart is, and you will deny me, and you will fall from your steadfastness before this night is over. Satan has come and asked permission to sift you like wheat, Peter, but I've prayed for you. You will not fall uh, et eternally. So when you get up, when you're restored, Peter, go strengthen your brethren. And that's what he's been doing to us for the last three years. Peter has come to the end of his run as he writes this letter. He says, I'm done. I'm finishing up my life. The end of strengthening the brethren and the church of God is about to be finished. Here's my swan song. Here's my last letter to you. His death is imminent. He'll soon be crucified, as we're told in John 21. And so these would be his last words to the church of God. Therefore, all that he has said... Here is what you need to do. Here is how I can strengthen you, church of God, so that you don't fall from your steadfastness. Guys, they're going to fall from steadfastness all, the, all, all common. It'll be commonplace in the end days. Most people's love will grow cold if the days weren't shortened. And so in these end days, you're going to watch people fall left and right from their own steadfastness. And you better not give a Peter response and say, that could never be me. It's supposed to wake you up and say, God, don't let that be me. What is Peter writing about? How do I stay steadfast in the days that are coming upon us and are now? But you do not say to Jesus, it couldn't be me. No false teacher could just trick me. I'm a logical genius. Discernment runs through my veins. There's not a chance. Oh, that you would fear from the great apostle Peter the one so sold out for Jesus, the one who always stood for him, the one that walked on water, chased him, whatever it took, that's the one writing this epistle. The one who said, I will never fall away, was the one who fell. 
And his heart is that everyone in this room would never fall away from this sweet Christ all the way till the end. Listen to this great leader's last words, his therefore, so to speak, in light of what's coming, therefore, uh, oh, the takeaway, my friends, from the last couple of years will be this morning. What should I come away with from all of our studying of Peter? And that's what we will look at this morning. So here's your outline. Two things. Peter gives us uh, two final exhortations to close out this epistle. And in verse 17, he's going to tell us a negative thing that we must run from. And then in verse 18, a positive thing that we must run to. So let's just take up those two simple points. The first one in verse 17, the negative thing that people of God, we must run from. (coughs) Verse 17, you therefore, beloved, saints, children of God, loved, affection. You therefore, holy ones who we love, knowing this beforehand, be on your guard so that you're not carried away by the error of unprincipled men and you fall from your own stead fastness. Be on your guard. There's destruction coming. Don't fall. Be, be alert. Be watching. Okay? You're, you're in end times. You're in warfare. Stay alert. Keep those eyes open so that you're not carried away by the air of unprincipled men, kind of like a little current. And, and you just, you, you, you hang with the wrong people, the wrong friends, the wrong crowd, and you listen to them, or you read them, or you, you get your theology from Hollywood, or all these different places. He's saying, be on guard. It's like a Psalm 1. He says, don't walk with the wicked or stand or sit in the seat of scoffers there's a progression you just start walking with them and then you sit with them and next thing you know you're you're just talking like them and you're scoffing just like them you're going to get carried away by this current of the day of the false teachers of people just telling you you can live any way you want it doesn't matter quit listening to that or you're going to slowly start believing it it's going to sink in take in all that wrong thinking and it will affect the way you live bad communications corrupts good morals and what will come doesn't matter what why does it matter so much pastor that i do this well because you're going to fall from your own steadfastness that's why i have such a heart and a burden for this steadfastness means firmness it's really the opposite of unstable it's one who is stable so a firm stance on the truth you're you're taking the the truth in you're standing on it and you're growing in it and you're fighting all the lies around you <clears throat> on a daily basis. You're going you're gonna to fight against these lies. Write down 1 Timothy 1, 18 through 20. And go look at it when you get home. Uh, baptisms, i got to speed up a little bit. So guys, we've got to stay steadfast, not fall from it. Be steadfast in truth and life and hope. God, don't let me be moved away from this blessed hope that I have of the soon return of Jesus Christ. That's chapter 2 in a nutshell. What not to do? Avoid these guys. Don't listen to them. Keep keep being steadfast. We must stay at it. And so now I want to look at what should we do then? I need to avoid the negative false teaching. So what should I be about on the positive side? And that was chapter 1, and that has been what we've been looking at in chapter 3. So your second point, the positive thing that we must run to, listen to verse 18. But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be the glory both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. There's an antidote to deception, right? There's an antidote to deception. To grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Trees with their roots that reach down deep into springs and rivers are strong and they're not easily knocked over. We're going to stretch those roots into the grace and the knowledge that we learned, epigenosis, the full knowledge of who Christ is in his word. I just keep stretching my roots into that and drinking it up. The only way not to fall, people, is to grow in the grace of God. We've got to keep growing or we're going to we're going to fall we're going to fall from our steadfastness i remember i had a i don't want to say which one but i had a child who he just didn't learn things as well as the other kids and i had to teach him to ride a bike and the other four just boom took it and this one was just he just could never quite get it and and he rode right into a fence one day and i'm just like you gotta hit the brakes 
son. So I gave it away. At least it's a boy. And I just kept saying, if you don't pedal, you will fall over. And I just again and again, he'd just quit pedaling, and he'd just sit there real stiff and fall over. <coughs> that is what I see in the Christian life. You quit pedaling. You quit growing in the grace of God, and you're going to fall from your steadfastness. Just look, look with me, if you will. Flip back to 2 Peter chapter 1. I want you to see what is bookend on both sides of this epistle that Peter wrote. And if you'll look in verse 2, here's how Peter begins his epistle. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. I just pray that grace and peace will be being multiplied, that you'll be growing in his power and in the peace that comes from being right with God. I just pray that that will keep growing through the knowledge of Jesus Christ and God the Father. And then flip back to chapter 3, 18. So here's the bookend of his whole epistle. He begins, I pray for that. I want you to have that. And at the end, he exhorts you, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. This is what Peter's after. This is what he's been writing for and wanting for the church of God. It just becomes so clear and beautiful to me what Peter wants for his readers. It begins and it ends with the grace of God. Peter's desire that you experience lots and lots of grace in your life. He wants your roots to go so down deep into Christ who's what? Full of grace and truth. It just goes layers and layers. There's no end to the grace of God. And I just want your roots to keep going deep into Christ and drawing from that resource so you'll be a vine that will bear much fruit. <clears throat> that your roots would get there and you would just soak it up. The grace of God. I love that grace wasn't just some thing he just stuck in you and now you're like a battery empowered Christian and you just go until the battery runs out when you die. He just made it where you, you, you don't have any of your own grace. And your whole life, you've got to come to the only one who uh, has grace. And you've got to live upon it on a day, moment by moment, second by second grace that comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Bask in it. That's the cry of Peter's heart for your heart this morning. And so, uh, one preacher, I love this statement, he said, grace is the most unused resource in the universe. And it's the most abundant resource because it's infinite and it has no end. So there's this thing called grace, and he says, it's the most unused resource in the universe. And it's the most abundant resource that there is. And so what he wants us then is to not have grace unused, but that we would learn to keep growing in the grace of Almighty God and being transformed in the image of Jesus Christ. Grace is the only way that you will ever grow into what we've learned in 2 Peter. Grace is the only way that you will not fall from your own steadfastness. Grace will cause you to stand and stand you will in Romans 14. So this must be then where the believer lives. I live in grace. I live in Christ, growing in the true knowledge of him. Paul said that I may know him. That's our passion. It's so beautiful. And so as we began this letter, we, do you remember what we, those who were here, we talked about Peter's desire for us to grow in grace, and we parked and spent a whole sermon on how. And now I just want to close out this letter with Peter's desire is for you to grow. That, that's what his passion is uh, for us, to grow in grace. And so I just want to look at three principles of how we grow in grace, and then we will thank God for our season together and pray for that very thing. So just three principles. Growth in grace is given. It's possible. And this is so important to me because our growth has been generated. It's been regenerated. It's been birthed into you. Do you remember back in 1 Peter 1, he said you've been born again to a living hope. That the seed of God, the Holy Spirit, has come within you and caused you to be born again. You, you've been birthed now into the new kingdom and into Christ. And so this is so essential to the Christian life because the false teaching in our enemy, as we learned in chapter 2, has deceived so many in the church today. Most people look at growth in this way. 
There are things that I need to do if I'm a Christian. I want to work on this, 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 this. I'm going to try a little bit of this. I'm going to learn my duties and just keep trying to do them. I'm going to read. I'm going to go to church. I'm going to share once in a while, and I'm going to be a nice guy. And I'm going to lead family worship in my home. But the Christian life is just so much more than that. Because there is a new life birthed in you, and that's been Peter's whole passion in both letters. You've been birthed by God. The Holy Spirit has now taken up residence within every believer. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you're unregenerate, you're not saved. So it's, it's, it's beautiful. I will birth you. I'll put my spirit within you, and I'm going to give you a whole new spiritual life. I like what Kyle said, man. If any, therefore, if anyone's in Christ, the old is gone, the new has come, you're a new creation. That's what happens. <laughs> you, t- you saw it testified this morning. So our calling now is to nurture and to develop the new life that has been implanted within us. Every one of us received the new birth, and the calling is now to nurture it and to grow it and let it consume and overtake us. Do you remember 2 Peter 1.4? You are partakers of the divine nature. You have now, you have the Holy Spirit within you, and you are having a koinonia with God himself. You've been birthed. And so the admonition to every birthed Christian is grow. That's it. You need to grow. What do we say to 16-year-olds who still act like babies? Grow up. (laughs) Grow up. And that's what all of us, Peter's saying to every one of you this morning, grow up. You you come and you're born as an infant. You come as a baby in seed form. And now he's saying germinate and grow. You got everything you need for life and godliness. Grow in the Christian life. And that just gets missed so often in the Christian life. Our life, people, is not just duties. It's not just disciplines, and it's not just finding a place to serve. Yea, it is all of those things, but it's not just that. It's so common that you don't even realize it's wrong. Uh, that that we, we don't just grow that way. That's just like throwing bricks on a pile. And I just keep throwing bricks and bricks and bricks. It's the most unorganic thing there is. And I just keep trying to add more things to my Christian life and I'm working at it. That is not a vine and a branch in what Peter's been writing about. Abiding in Christ and blossoming and blooming and bearing fruit for the kingdom of God. And we're so used to just trying to add all these little things and it's, it just we, we've gotten used to it and we think that's the Christian life. Just give me another brick and let me add it to my pile. We're used to it. I remember I went to college up at UNC. Do uh, you know where that is in Greeley? I don't know if you've ever been there, but it smells. <laughs> all there all there are is cattle farms all around. And when you got the right breeze, man, it would just come right in your dorm room and you're like, oh, why did I go to school at Northern Colorado? And then I remember like three months into it, someone came up to visit me and they're like, oh, that smells awful. I'm like, what smell? <laughs> I'm so used to smelling manure, I don't even notice it any longer. And I think in the church, we are so used to adding a brick to the pile of everybody just trying to, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, I'm going to add a little more of this. And we've lost this organic, beautiful power and nature of God that he has called us to in the Christian life. I I want something so much better than a brick pile for you. I want a full blossoming tree, fruit all over you. The New Testament gives us commands and admonitions and duties. But it always assumes a therefore. It always assumes that you've had the new birth. And in light of the new birth, therefore, go live and do these things. It assumes that you've been born again. You can do none of them unless you've been born from, a God, from above. The seed of God is in you. And so all of it assumes that. Any command given to a New Testament believer assumes that you've been born again and the life of God is within you. And do you remember back in verses 5 through 7? I'm going to read it again in chapter 1. For this reason also apply all diligence in your faith. Here it is, guys. Grow in this. Moral excellence knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, and agape. I want you to be growing in these things. And if you look at them as a brick pile, you're just going to go try to work at love. And what's going to happen the first time someone steps on your toes? You're done. I love everybody. I, I forbear everyone until they hurt me. 
And then you just, the, that's what brick piles do. It's not organic, it's just external, and they, they break really fast, and you'll never become like Jesus Christ. You'll be Pharisees is the best thing you're ever going to get. So hear this this morning. The grace of God has been implanted within you. Grow in it. Grow in grace. Isn't that bigger than be good? The New Testament never just says that. In our day and age, there's a call to be nice, care about each other, follow Jesus' teaching. The world will be a better place. The Bible has given us a new morality, and I hope your Christianity is more than that. I sat at dinner last week with Kyle and Alyssa, who were just baptized, and all I could do is smile and say, oh, the power of this gospel. Kyle, just when I first met him, that guy looked like he wanted to eat me every time we met. He just looked mean, angry, and gnarly. And the last time we met, he giggled through the whole meeting, smiling <laughs> about the grace of God, and he couldn't quit rejoicing. And I'm like, I love this gospel. Because that's not a brick on a pile. That's a guy who's met Jesus, and he's transforming him from the inside to the outside. So get this. What the Bible calls us to live and do is impossible. Be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. How's that going for you, unbeliever? <laughs> Love your enemies. Turn the other cheek. Sacrificially give. Share Christ with all. Honor your parents. Love your wives like Christ loved the church. So guys, you, you have to get this. The Bible never just says be good, but nurture and grow in the new life that's been implanted in your soul that can love your wife like that. The life of God in the soul of man is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Don't stop short with just rules and external stuff. You can't grow that way, the way the New Testament calls you, unless you have this new life implanted in you, the divine nature. You know what the most exhausting thing is? To try to live the Christian life when you haven't got the new seed. All it is is just someone always laboring, and you get nowhere, and you're frustrated. That is the worst place to ever live. I'm offering you something so sweet this morning, to have the power of God within you, changing and transforming you into the image of Jesus Christ. So I just want you to hear this. 3.18 of Peter assumes one for that you have the, the, the divine, you're a partaker of the divine nature. And when you are, grow. Grow in the grace and the knowledge that comes from knowing Jesus Christ. So what are some applications with that in mind? I, I want you to, to let this set you free is hear this. You can grow and you must grow because God's given you everything you need to do it. You can't live this life without a new birth. And if anyone is trying, that is the most frustrating, sad place to just keep throwing stones on a pile. Hearing new sermons, reading more blogs, more rocks that you got to throw on, it's exhausting and it makes you heavy, laden, and weary. And Christ says, come to me, new birth, and my yoke is easy and my burden is light when this gets implanted within you. Growth is now supernatural and it's all of grace. So I'll ask you a question. Have you made peace with some of the enemies of grace in your own heart? Because I need to hear this again and again, that I have that seed implanted, and I can and I must grow. And you can get content with sins in your life that just say they're not going away. And you start to live with them, and you're content with them. And I, I want to rip that out of your mind and your heart. I, I just want to jump on your toes and smash them this morning and say that's wrong. Quit thinking that way. Don't make peace with sin, when you have the new seed implanted within you, his power to overcome sin and be transformed into his image. Do not settle for anything less. Don't be happy with just believing in Jesus and that's it. The gospel is to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. And so you have been at this maybe for decades and decades and you sit here and you're just a gnarly dude. You're just mean. You're nasty. You're judgmental. You, you, you just walk out of church every Sunday and you have 10 people to judge so you feel better about yourself. You're just unloving. You got all your doctrine and you love nobody but your books of dead men. You got broken relationships everywhere you go. Just conflict is your name. Unforgiveness. Just bitter in there and it won't come out. Any difficult relationship, you're done. Oh, let's pack up and leave. 
Self is a center reference point. You've accepted not loving your wife. You're content in it. You're happy to just keep exasperating your children to no end. You just keep throwing on more law, more bricks. Here, kids, my brick pile, why don't you build the same brick pile? And you're exasperating them, and you won't stop. (laughs) You're a bad friend. You're obnoxious. You have a slanderous tongue. You're lazy to the bride of Christ. You're apathetic to it. You're building securities and everything on this earth that are going to burn up. Are, Are you content with that? Or you look and say the divine nature has been implanted within you. You can overcome any evil or any sin because of what this is. And I just want optimism to flow and and go crazy this morning because of the power of Almighty God. Do you see the hope? We can grow and we must grow. Bricks on a pile cannot overcome these issues. Have you settled for too little? I did. And I'm looking for so much more growth based on what I've learned in Peter. The word grow challenges the stagnant. Quit being stagnant when the power of God is right there within you. Secondly, sorry, we're going to go a little over. Someone go tell the nursery workers I love them and we'll buy them lunch afterwards. (laughs) Growth and grace then is gradual. Don't miss the second part. I need this because the first point can really discourage us. (laughs) The first point uh, gives the the second point even more life, this one. So remember, do you remember when we we started this series and I talked about an acorn and it can be planted there in the cement and, and all of a sudden it will grow and it will just break forth from all the cement and this beautiful oak tree will come forth. And the same thing with you, what can break out of your depravity and your sin, uh, this acorn can grow, but it is very slow. Christian growth is not just big crisis and mountaintops. Most people, their growth is only mountaintops. That's not true growth. Grass is greener, sky is bluer in those seasons. It's just so gradual that it can be imperceptible. Very. You're just growing and you got to look back sometimes years and say, look what God is doing. 20 years as a pastor of the same church I get to watch the growth, and, and some of you I've known for 20 years. And I'm, I was just thinking this week of some of you that I've known that long, and I just marvel at the growth of what God did. And I don't even remember any spurts. I just look, and I'm like, wow, it is amazing the oak tree that God has sprung up. Guys, this is hard, because what do we like as Americans? Fast, right? Fast. If my internet takes more than two seconds, i I got to get a new computer. It's too slow. And we've got time-lapse photography where you can just watch a plant grow like in 30 seconds. There isn't that in the Christian life. God is not slow about his promises, he said, like a thousand years or like a day to him on his second coming. Well, how about our spiritual growth? He's patient and he's growing up oak trees. And so I want you to quit looking to be the on fire guy or girl who's going to change the world. I've seen that a hundred times and it lasts for a year. Great highs and great lows aren't going to change the kingdom of God. But steady growth and grace that just won't give up and keep seeking the face of Christ to, to grow from him and know him and get this grace, to grow in the grace and knowledge, learn how to think those thoughts uh, toward the race that is set before them to just keep running. And so I learned something this week that I did not know. I bet 90% of you knew it, but trees even grow in the winter. I I always thought it was summer, spring, but they they actually grow in the winter. And someone checked me on that. I just read it. Too many of us are just like the little kid that just wants to grow up. I just want to be big now. I remember when I was, I was younger and I just wanted to get bigger for football and I was like, I just got to grow. And I was asking my parents and I, it had to have been my brothers that told me this. Um, that's the problem with having older brothers. They said, go hang on the chin-up bar every day and you, you will grow. And, and I, I went to that crazy thing and did it every day for as long as I could hold on. And then they, they measured me a week later and it didn't do anything. And I just think so many are like that. I'm, I'm just not growing. That didn't work. That class didn't work. 
uh, that program didn't work. And we're just always running around looking for the, the quickest you know, home run ball. What will make me grow? Let me go to the Crusades. Let me go to all these uh, big conferences all over the world. And you get your highs and all these things keep happening and you're not growing. And you just got to dig in and, and do the, the, the old paths and stay at them and persevere in the things that God has said will bring about growth. It's not pretty. It's not sexy. But it works to stay in the means and seeking him and letting him slowly grow up oak trees. And it will be slow and it will be gradual. And that's why we need people with us for the long haul. I want you to go up to someone who knows you really well and just say, am I growing? We need people who will, who will answer you that way. And if they look at you and laugh, accept it. Don't get mad. Okay, like you, that means something's wrong. And go, go. we need people who know us. Praise God, I can say yes to so many of you faithful saints who have consistently and steadily given yourselves to the means of grace. I've been overwhelmed with how God is growing you and the fruit and what is coming out. I, I just, uh, I'm on a keto diet. You can't eat fruit. And I just feel like I eat it every day because of you guys. It's on your limbs. It's hanging. I get to enjoy it all day long. Thank you, Jesus. So growth is given. Growth is gradual. And we'll close with gross, uh, growth is, in grace is gracious. Peter does not command us to just grow, does he? What does he say? He says, I want you to grow in grace. That's that inner organic stuff that I've been talking about this whole sermon. And so this is where I see so many getting confused is they hear grow in grace. And you say, wait, you, you can't grow in grace. It's perfect. It's done it's full. Yet, yet here I am, I'm being commanded to grow in it. So my whole life I've been learning to rest in grace. You can't add to it. And now you're saying grow in it. Which is it? Well, in one sense of the word, grace is what God has done for us in Christ to draw us to himself in a love relationship to be blessed by him for all of eternity. Jesus came into the world. And he said, te telestai, it's finished. I've accomplished salvation, grace to any who will come to me. I lived the life that you should have and I died the death that you deserve. It's yours. It's finished. Come drink. Believe upon me. Rest in grace. Rest in the finished work of Christ. In Christ, God completely accepts you and loves you. He justifies you legally and he adopts you personally. It's all finished and completed. It's wonderful. And so I just want you to hear this. You cannot increase it. You can't make God love you anymore this morning. It's abundant and infinite in Christ. You can't be more forgiven than you are right now by Jesus. You cannot be more adopted. You cannot be more accepted by God right now. Drink that up. So then what is Peter commanding us to do? Well, he's saying grow in grace. And now he's saying, okay, now that you have that, Go to the person of grace and let the influence of this grace transform and change you. Let, let the influences of grace now change you from one image of glory to the next. Grow in your knowledge of it. Get in the scriptures and learn and stay in it and just keep marveling at the grace of Christ. It's influence upon your mind and your heart and your will. You just can't take these things in enough of what God has done for us in Christ. I, I live in it. I fight for it every day to keep my mind and heart in this glorious gospel. And that is the power that God will use to transform you and change you. So if fear and guilt and shame and approval of others is what drives you, or even the lie of trying to grow in that first kind of grace to get accepted by God. If I keep going to church and cleaning up, then God will love me. If you live in either of those, it's just a brick pile. And, and you will not grow organically. So guys, this is a close. It's a call to grow in the sweetness of God's grace to us in Christ. To get this deep, sweet knowledge of the amazing thing of what Christ has done. The height and the depth and the breadth and the length of the love that God has for us in Christ. And as you grow in that, you will grow in real, true love. You will love like no other. You will grow in moral excellence and joy and peace. You'll become wiser and deeper and more peaceful and courageous and unified with all those who differ. It will be amazing what will spring up from those who will behold this Christ. And so I pray, Southside, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ.
To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. May, may he get all the glory because it's all of him. And just, oh, worship and marvel and love this Christ. One, one man said, I would hate my own soul if I found it not loving Christ. He, he's excellent and he's worthy of all. And let's keep drawing near and drawing from that beautiful vine all that we can from the sweetness and beauty of Christ. So let's close in prayer. And then I'll come up and give us a final doxology after we sing. God, I, I praise you for how you met us in Peter. Lord, I cry now for every one of these souls. I pray that we would grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray that we've learned well in this epistle of how that happens. I pray that, Lord, we would be overwhelmed with such a sweet gospel that has taken our sins as far as the east is from the west and made us accepted and approved and you've adopted us. You're now our Father. God, the, the list just goes on and on and on. You've given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Let every heart be overwhelmed with that and let it make us hunger for more now that we would draw near to this Christ and get the grace to, to just take that sap and let it run through our branches until fruit breaks out into our lives and we are these little oaks that slowly start overcoming sins that we've allowed to be in our lives for way too long. God, let this be a turning point in many lives where we will start seeking to be made holy by grace and not by law. God, I pray, let the beauties of Christ metamorphose us into the image of Jesus Christ. Pour out your abundant grace on Southside Bible Church, I pray. Amen. The preceding message was presented by Southside Bible Church in Centennial, Colorado, and we hope you've been challenged and encouraged to grow in your relationship with Christ. Each week, our sermons are made available online and may be downloaded and distributed. If you have questions or comments or would like to speak to one of our pastors, please contact us through our website at southsidebible.org.